Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. Guys, welcome to the channel. This is Gaming Imperfectly. I am King Pigley, and I hope you like what you see. But before we jump into today's story, I want to clear up some things. There's some things going on, and I want to address them real quick. So bear with me for just one second, and I'm going to make this as fast as I possibly can. I want you to understand that these cases are about human beings that have gone missing. Okay, It is super serious, and there's nothing joking or funny about them. These are people's families. These are people's brothers and sisters, mothers, daughters, sons, uncles, brothers, I, grandparents, and they, they were loved. They were cherished, and the fact that they have disappeared or been found deceased or uh, never found at all has irreparably damaged, harmed, hurt their families in ways that most of us can't understand. And so, in the spirit of that, I want you guys to understand that, yes, I'm telling these stories, uh, but it is because I believe that people should keep these people's memories alive. For those that haven't been found, maybe there's some hope that they will be found, and that the more people that know about these cases, maybe we could spread the word that something crazy is going on out there to where all these people are disappearing. Now, the missing 411 cases come from David Politis, guys. It is a series of books. Uh, David Politis was a police detective. These are his books. Okay, um, There are 10 of them now. There were nine. He actually just put out a new book called Missing 411 Montana. All right, I will leave a link to David Politis' where you can purchase his books. Also, he has a uh, YouTube channel. I will leave a uh, link for that as well. Also, guys, he has two documentaries that are currently, I do believe, right here on YouTube that you can watch for free called Missing 411 and also Missing 411 The Hunted. And I will, if they are indeed free on YouTube right now, leave a, descript, a link in the description so you can watch those if you care to. Most importantly, guys, I want to make it clear that I am not stealing anything from David Politis. Okay? I have reached out to Mr. Politis. I have reached out to him asking him permission to continue to use um, his case files that he compiled in these books to bring these stories to you. I don't think Mr. Politis would mind me doing this, and I try to do this in the most respectful way. However, as I said, I do not have his direct permission. If I hear back from him and he asks me to stop using uh, Missing 411 in my titles, or in my thumbnails, or even in, in my storytelling, I most certainly will. I have no problem with that. Um, and I will still recommend you guys get these books and uh, go to his channel and correct, uh, connect directly with Mr. Politis so you can learn more about these missing cases and the whole missing 411 phenomenon. That being said, guys, as of right now, I'm going to continue to tell these stories because I, one, respect Mr. Politis and the work that he's done so very much that I think it should be shared, and two... I am going to honor the missing and their families by telling these stories to get the word out there so these people aren't forgotten. And that maybe, just maybe, somebody might see one of these videos, who knows, and know something and contact the local authorities. But anyway, guys, that's all I needed to say. I wanted to clear the air real quick because I have been getting some comments about using David Politis' stuff and how I'm stealing from him and this, that, and the other. And he actually has on his channel... And the, the, I think the last three videos addressed channels using his material without his permission. And that is the last thing I want to do. I am not a thief, guys. And I am not that type of person. That is not who I am personally. So I want you guys to know. I've reached out to David Politis. I hope to hear back from him. And if I do and he asks me to stop, I will. But uh, until then, I'm going to keep bringing these cases to you because I think it's important. So let's dive into today's story. It's a strange one. Back in 1976, guys, Stephen was a 19-year-old young man, and he had the world in front of him. The world was his oyster. He lived in New York. He went to college in New York. He was actually going to a community college in Syracuse, New York. And in the spring and April of 1976, Stephen and a group of friends decided that they were going to go up to Mount Marcy to go hiking. And they were going to summit Mount Marcy. They actually wanted to get to the top. Now, Mount Marcy is a tall mountain. In fact, it's, uh, as far as I know, New York's tallest mountain at over 5,000 feet. It's not a huge mountain by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, on, as far as West Coast standards are concerned, you know, Colorado, uh, Rocky Mountains, 5,000 feet's not that much. But as far as East Coast standards are concerned, 
uh, in the, the Appalachian mountain chain or in the Adirondacks, 5,000 feet high up, guys. And so uh, this, this particular climb, it could be challenging. Nonetheless, the friends wanted to do it, and they were all outdoorsmen. Stephen himself had actually done quite a bit of hiking out west and stuff, Washington and whatnot. And so he was well-versed in the outdoors, and he was quite fit. Again, he's 19 years old. He's in the prime of his life. And so all the buddies get together. They get their gear, and even one of their buddies brings his dog along. And on the morning of uh, April the 12th, 1976, they arrive at Mount Marcy, and they head up the mountain. As they're making their way up this mountain, guys, it was rough going. Uh, they was a, it was a harder climb than I think they expected. However, um, uh, Stephen was, like I said, in very good shape. And none of the guys were, like, fatigued and falling out or, or like, oh, we're pushing too hard. The weather wasn't that bad. Again, it's early spring, and they're higher up in elevation, so it's cool, but it's not frigid. And they were having a fairly good time. As the day progressed, the guys got tireder and tireder. And before they made Summit, in fact, they weren't very far from the Summit, uh, but they decided to stop. They reached a uh, plateau which actually had a shelter there, a, like, like a you know, hostel-type shelter where people could camp and stay and have a little cover over them, like a lean-to. And so they decided they were going to set up camp in this area, and they were going to Summit in the morning. The guys all set up their camp, and they, they were having some tea and whatnot, and, and just chatting and, and uh, conversing with one another about the day's climb and joking. So Stephen puts on a, uh, he decides, you know, he's looking at his map, and he tells the guys, you know what, guys, I think I'm going to summit, and uh, just go check it out. It's just right up there, I, you know, I'm, I won't be gone long. And at this point in time, it's like 3.30 in the afternoon, 4.30 in the afternoon. It's really not that late. And so, I mean, it's spring, so the sun's still going down fairly early in the day. But, it's, you know, the guys are like, sure, man, it's not that bad. The weather wasn't that bad, so it's said no problem. Steven then, instead of putting all his gear back on and everything, just puts on a yellow, like, rain slicker, like a rain jacket, a yellow rain jacket, bright yellow, guys. This thing was not easily, you know, easily missed. And then proceeded to go up the trail. Um, a after a few hours, the weather actually shifted. Um, a huge, horrible, nasty storm came in. The winds whipped up. Snow started pouring down. The temperature actually dropped to 10 degrees. It was frigid, bitterly cold. The friends started getting worried about Stephen. And by 10 o'clock that night, they couldn't find him. They went up the trail. But they couldn't see because of the wind and the, and the snow. It was blizzard conditions. They had no visibility, and it actually drove them back to their tents. The weird thing about that night is that the guy with the dog kept trying to get his dog to go out uh, with him to go look for Steven, and the dog refused to leave the tent. It would sit in the tent cowering and whining. This is reportedly very odd behavior by the owner of this dog. He told this to the authorities that his dog doesn't behave like this. And so the, the dog not wanting to leave the tent is super weird. Nonetheless, after being driven back into the tents by the storm, these friends gave up that night looking for Stephen. They only hoped that he would come back, and he never did. So in the morning, they got up again, and they went back up the mountain looking for Stephen, but there was no sign of him. And after a few hours of searching for him the next day, they went down the mountain and got the authorities. Now this kicked off. The, one of the largest searches in New York State history. Hundreds and hundreds of people, helicopters, dogs, park rangers, different agencies. Every, and you can imagine, people were everywhere combing this mountain. And nothing. Now something to be known about Mount Marcy is that it is a cluster site, which means that there are numerous disappearances in that area and have been going on for quite some time. Stephen Thomas is not the first person to ever go missing in that area. And that's something to be very understood, should be seriously understood about this. Now, after a few days of searching, and, and again, uh, with the weather finally bre uh, break, giving a break, but no sign of him was found. I mean, no helicopter found him, no hiking, hundreds of people combing it, no sign. I mean, zero signs of Stephen. So Stephen's brother, Bob, who was seven years older than him, and a devoted brother. I mean, this guy loved his little brother, Stephen. Uh, Bob quit his job in Utica and actually moved to the Mount Marcy area. And in between working uh, a job, he would spend his time on Mount Marcy hiking, walking places, going off trail, going in back places, 
uh, rough terrain, going anywhere he could, looking for some sign of his brother. The park rangers even started joking around that Bob Tom Thomas knew Mount Marcy better than they did. By Bob's own admission, he's logged somewhere around 600 miles on Mount Marcy. Just one area, walking around it, 600 miles. Um, but not, in, not totally in vain. He never found his brother. Bob Thomas has yet to ever find a single shred of evidence of his brother Stephen. However, uh, Bob did actually find another hiker who had gone missing back in 1973 that they had never found. And Bob actually, with his dog, he had a dog named Winter. And Winter was started digging in the snow in this one particular area while they were looking for Stephen. And they found the body of a missing hiker that had gone missing in 1973. So, that says two things. One, it, it's really weird that we haven't found Stephen's body or found Stephen at all. And we don't know at all what happened to Stephen. Like, Stephen completely vanished. All right, No, he never came down the trail. He went up the trail to summit Mount Marcy and never came down. So we don't know anything about his disappearance other than the fact that he's gone. What we do know, though, is that a hiker that got lost in the same area in 1973 wasn't found until 1976. So it took three years and just happenstance for Bob Thomas to stumble across uh, another missing person. So is there a chance that Stephen Thomas is up on that mountain that he slipped and maybe fell down into a uh, crevasse or, or fell into a, uh, some sort of, I don't know, so, some way is obscured, like rubble fell on him or a tree? I don't know. I mean, what? where did he go? It seems to me that that bright yellow jacket that he was wearing would have just completely stood out to uh, helicopters or to hikers or to anybody that was looking for him. Why didn't the dog want to leave the tent? You know, the, his, uh, Stephen's friend's dog that he took with him. Why didn't he want to leave the tent? If you look at the missing 411 phenomenon, bad weather almost always ensues after these people go missing, inhibiting search efforts. Um, coincidental, maybe. You know, I, I don't think so. But it's what, what opinions are when it comes to cases like this are very valuable as far as I'm concerned because critical thinking, think outside the box. What do you think happened? But it is like he got beamed away. It's like he's gone. He just vanished off that mountain. But how did he get off the mountain? If that's the case, how did he get off the mountain? If somebody took him, who took him, and how did they get him off the mountain in the middle of a storm? None of this makes sense, guys. All I can say is my heart breaks for Bob Thomas and his family, uh, Stephen's family, uh, I can only imagine. I have brothers, and I can only imagine what it would be like to lose a family member like that and to never have the closure of what happened to them. Um, again, Stephen's uh, case remains a mystery to this day, and it is certainly a doozy. But uh, all in all, guys, that's all I got for you today. Again, with the missing 411 cases, guys, I hope you're enjoying them. I will try to keep doing them for as long as I can. And I am looking into getting direct permission from David Politis. So there's no issues with me bringing you guys these cases. Because ultimately, I do believe that it is super important. And it's, uh, it's just heartbreaking to me that these people have gone missing and that they're forgotten about sometimes. Or that nobody even talks about them. I mean, the fact is, I wouldn't know about any of these cases if David Politis hadn't have put these books together and I haven't read them. And that tells you something right there, that nobody's talking about them. They're not mainstream media, but they this happened, guys. This is real life, and this is happening, and it's happening all the time. And in fact, right now, in Fairbanks, Alaska, um, eight people are missing since May, since last May. So in less than a year, eight people have gone missing in Fairbanks, Alaska, and it's such a problem that they're really addressing this right now. It's in the news. I mean, you can look this up. Eight people in less than a year have gone missing in Fairbanks, five of them Native Americans, most of them men, but not all of them. Super weird. Weird stuff is happening all the time. And people like David Politis is putting the message out there, trying to make people aware. Which leads me to my last statement to you guys. If you're going outdoors, guys, if you're going to go into the wildlands of North America to have a good time with your friends, one, don't separate. Stay together. All right? At least go in pairs. Have a buddy system. All right? And if you are going to go off by yourself, be prepared, guys. Carry food, carry water, take more than you need, take proper clothing, take extra clothing, take a GPS locator. 
Super important, guys. They make them. They're not very expensive. Take a locator beacon with you. It's better to be safe than sorry because I care what happens to you guys. But anyway, that's it for King Piggly today. If you did enjoy this video, please smash the like button. It helps me out. Let's me know you're enjoying the content. Also, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing. Keep coming back. Click that bell, though. New, old, get the notifications, guys. Don't miss out on the next scary, dark, macabre, spooky, true story that I bring to Gaming Imperfectly. But that's it for King Piggly today. I'm out of here. And I will see you guys in the next video.